actually going to look at a few key verses, several key verses in chapter 14, and then we're going to touch on a couple verses in chapter 15 as well. Now, let me just say this is um, probably one of the most difficult messages that um, could be discussed. I mean, in terms of any issue under the category of Christian theology, this is a very painful, uh, difficult topic. I don't really look forward to getting into this, but it's really necessary. We're going to talk about the issue of hell. We're going to talk about the issue of eternal conscious torment. Uh, So the title of this session is The Consuming Fire and the Endurance of the Saints. Uh, And let me apologize, by the way, it's like 85 degrees here in the studio, so I'll probably drip and sweat by the end. It's not because of the topic, um, it's just because it's hot in here, but probably appropriate, I guess, for the for the uh, subject matter. So we're going to jump in in Revelation 14. We're going to start in verse 9, and we're going to read forward through till uh, verse 13. So it says, Then another angel, a third one, following them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who receive the beast, uh, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Verse 12, he says, Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Here is the perseverance of those who have faith in God and in Jesus. They obey him, they believe him, and they obey him. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. From this point forward, anyone who is a Christian and dies is blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. So really some powerful statements here. Now, I want to talk a bit about the connection between this issue of our endurance, not just in this life now, yes, in this life now, but ultimately in the final hour of testing and tribulation that will come upon the earth, that we as the followers of Jesus will endure and walk through. I want to talk about the connection between our endurance and the issue of hell, the reality of hell. Scripture in multiple places, and and really here it uses it, when it talks about endurance, it uses the analogy of a marathon. It uses the analogy of a race. Uh, So, you know, I just turned 50 a couple months ago, and so I'm kind of looking at my life right now, right? I go like 25 plus 25. I go one-third still ahead of me, yay, maybe a bonus decade, right? Like one-third, I have to finish this race. But really in terms of following the Lord, I came to faith at 19, so I've been walking with the Lord about 31 years or so, and again, 50, so 81. That's probably pretty reasonable. I go, I'm halfway there. I'm running a marathon. I've never done it before, and I'm halfway through. I've come this far but I need to set my heart for the long-term endurance, the next 31 years of faithfulness. Now, by the grace of God, I really do hope that Jesus will return before that. Um, But it's important that we sort of think in terms of some of the analogies that the scriptures use. I think also in terms of sort of the way that fasts work, because I want to touch on this issue in terms of the mind games that we play with ourselves. And in fact, much of what we're going to talk about today comes under the category of the games or even I'm going to say the lies that we tell ourselves to justify our lives. We're going to sort of get into this and touch on it. But I know, I mean, just to be real transparent, I have failed at way more fasts than I've succeeded in. You know, I've begun a lot of fasts. I finished far less than I've actually, uh, you know, sort of wimped out on halfway through. But it's amazing how how you can begin. You have this real clarity in your mind. You're like, okay, I want to give myself to the Lord. Here's all the reasons. Here's how long I'm going to go. And then, you know, sometimes a few days in, sometimes several days in, sometimes even a few weeks in, you start playing games. You start, your mind starts playing tricks on you. And you're like, you know, 
I mean, wh what am I even doing this for? And like, it's just crazy how hunger of any kind, any type of hunger, often will cause us to make really irrational decisions that seem to be very rational at the moment. And in so many ways, this issue of hell, because it's such a visceral, emotionally charged subject, I mean, it's not just a category of theology, it's a very real issue. It touches us in such a deep emotional place. It's very easy for our views concerning hell to be formed based on our own deceptive emotions and feelings, and less so based on what the scriptures actually teach. And when we allow that to happen in our lives, when we allow our emotions to begin determining what we believe versus what the scriptures actually say, we set ourselves up for tremendous deception. In fact, I would argue that this is really the greatest danger that we're all in. It's not so much buying into the lies of the world. I mean, of course, the world has plenty of lies out there. You know, we could talk about what the world says with regard to homosexuality or transgenderism or all these different things, abortion, you know, whether or not a, a baby is actually a human life and this type of thing. Like, there's so many messages that we could say, yes, the world holds things that are contrary to what the Bible teaches. And there is danger in believing the lies of the world. But the greatest danger is always believing the lies that we tell ourselves, that, that we embrace as ours rather than external. When we believe it's our own idea, that's the hardest idea to sort of root out of the heart, the lies that we tell ourselves. So I want to begin with a very key uh, verse that's formed so much of sort of my whole framework for following the Lord. It's Proverbs chapter 9, and this is repeated several times actually in Proverbs, but um, this is where it's first clearly stated. Proverbs 9 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Having a right, healthy, holy respect and fear, not just respect, but fear of the Lord is the foundation, is the starting point, the launching pad for wisdom. If we want to be those who walk in wisdom, the foundation for that, the, the transition from being a zombie who embraces the lives of this age, who embraces the zeitgeist, the spirit of this age, from the transition from being that sort of zombie, this is what I refer to myself before I get saved, I was a moral zombie. I just went with the flow into coming into reality, waking up to reality. The beginning of living a life of wisdom is awakening to the fear of the Lord and the knowledge, understanding, knowing, actually knowing the Holy One is understanding. Now, in light of the fact that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, I would add to this Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. Jesus himself actually quotes this, but he says, the Lord your God is a consuming fire is a jealous God. The Lord, our God, the one that we follow, our Father, it doesn't say that he is like a consuming fire. He himself is a consuming fire. And fear of the Lord, fear of the consuming fire, is the beginning of wisdom. To the point where I would actually say that waking up, again, as a unbelieving moral zombie to the reality concerning eternal punishment is often, and I know it was for me, the beginning of waking up, the beginning of wisdom. So I want to just start there. Now, the reason that I think this is so critical, first of all, you've got very strong language here in Revelation 14. We're going to look at a lot of other passages. But I think hands down, I came to faith again 31 years ago. Belief in hell, even talk about hell just 31 years ago, was pretty common in the church. Do a survey right now, like just do a little study, you know, review all of the sermons that your church has ever preached over the past five years. And I'm not picking on churches, don't get me wrong, um, or any of your favorite ministries. The discussion of hell, talk about hell, a mere mentioning of hell is incredibly rare these days. I would say to the point where when you look at some of these polls, it's amazing the percentage of Christians who don't believe in the reality of the punishment of the wicked, eternal conscious torment. They don't even believe in it anymore. It's, it is the, the slide uh, away from what the Bible actually teaches and instead embracing things that we desire to believe 
rather than embracing the uncomfortable things that the scriptures actually say is spreading like an epidemic throughout the church. I'm not going to give all the specific numbers. It's difficult when you look at Barna, you look at Pew Research, there's been a handful of polls um, and it's, they break them down sort of by millennials, Gen Z versus different generations and different things like that. And they also break it down between mainline Protestant churches, evangelical Christian churches, all Christians, including Catholics and this type of thing. But sometimes it's anywhere from 20% as upwards to 40% who don't even believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven who don't even believe that hell is even a possible reality. Now, they almost all believe in heaven, in the rewards of an afterlife, but very few believe in the punishment of the wicked. So this is where we are today, and I would argue that it's a significant part of all of our problems, not just those that are falling away, but those that remain in the church that would still say we believe in hell, but we're not actually living like we really believe it, oftentimes. And I say this, I include myself in this. If we really believed it, we would be far more, I mean, first of all, we would live a far more careful, cautious, sober, holy life, and we would be far more determined and deliberate about evangelism and missions, quite frankly. If we really believed it at a gut level, we would be far more active in a lot of ways, in prayer and evangelism and holiness, I mean, you name it. And again, I want to be clear, I do believe in the reality of hell, but sometimes when I weigh my life and I go, am I really living? Like I truly believe that at a deep emotional level, I would say no. I, I, oftentimes I don't, and it's something that I need to wrestle through myself, and I think we all need to wrestle through it in a very serious way, especially in light of the warnings concerning what is on the near future. Now, I'm going to do a little theology here. I'm going to talk a little bit about theology and history and the Bible and this sort of thing. But the main focus here I want to zero in on is pragmatic, where the rubber meets the road, practical theology in terms of how it affects our lives. And that's really what I want to get to. But before I do that, we do need to work through some sort of theology. So you really have sort of three different primary positions concerning the issue of hell within the church. You have traditionalism, Okay, what that means is those who hold to the most common pervasive church tradition down through history, which is the idea that the wicked and those who don't believe and have trust in God and Jesus, that their ultimate destiny is in hell, and that involves eternal conscious torment. Okay, so eternal conscious suffering, according to the scriptures, that's traditionalism. Then you also have annihilationism. Annihilationism is the idea that the wicked will ultimately be annihilated. They'll be destroyed. They will cease to exist. There will be no consciousness. They will be erased. They're just gone forever. That's annihilationism. Now, there's various forms of all of these things. We're going to sort of tease that out a bit. And then there's universalism. Universalism essentially holds that even after death, ultimately God will redeem everyone and even Hitler himself, and even in some cases the devil himself, will ultimately be redeemed and saved. Some include, some universalists believe that there is a period of purging and refining in hell, that hell is sort of restorative, and that ultimately even the wicked will all ultimately be saved. Now, if you're to take the two categories of annihilationism and universalism and weigh that against traditionalism and see you know, how many in the church hold to traditionalism versus these other two views, I would say these other two views are growing. And again, I want to be clear, they're growing not because the arguments for them are really powerful and solid and, and uh, persuasive, rather they're growing because people choose to believe what they want to believe, quite frankly. I'm a big uh, <laughs> believer you know, in the line from the Simon and Garfunkel song, he says, still a man hears what he wants to hear. And he just disregards the rest. You know, la, 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 la. And it's just, this is what we do. We choose to believe and pay attention to the things that suit us and the things that we're uncomfortable or, you know, our emotions don't like. We just tend to disregard them, ignore them, or outright find a way to craft an argument that says that they're, uh, they're invalid, that traditionalism is invalid. So obviously I'm not even going to take any time, quite frankly, to discuss universalism, the idea that everyone is ultimately saved. The scriptures are so clear that salvation is only found in Jesus and it's given unto man once to live and then comes judgment. 
You know, you don't get to sort of reform yourself in the afterlife. The scriptures are very clear about that. There will be those that will suffer the punishments of hell, whether you believe in annihilationism or eternal conscious torment. The wicked will inherit one of those things. I mean, the scriptures are so clear, so I'm not even going to take any time uh, to even hash through that. Again, to be clear, you'd be surprised. If you were to do a real comprehensive poll of everyone in your church, you'd be amazed at how many people that you go to church with actually embrace overtly or sometimes more subtly believe in universalism. And again, this is demonstrable based on the way people live. If we didn't believe, if we genuinely believe that some people who are lost will go to hell, we wouldn't be nearly as passive as we are with regard to sharing the gospel and the good news. We just wouldn't be. So now I just want to touch on the issue of annihilationism. So here's the thing. Annihilationism, again, the idea that that the wicked will be destroyed and cease to exist forever. Very rarely will you hear anyone use the term annihilationism anymore. Most often, those that are the most savvy um, understanding concerning this topic, they're going to use the term conditional immortality. You go, what's that? Well, first of all, let me just say this is typical. Um, You'll see this a lot. When someone embraces a view that's very unpalatable or the arguments for it are weak, they'll change the title. So a sort of classic example of this was years ago. Um, Those on the left would openly say, hey, I'm a liberal. They would celebrate that. Well, on a popular societal level, liberalism, at least here in the United States and probably to some degree throughout the West, it became sort of a dirty word. Nobody wanted to be called a liberal. Liberal was a very, like, overall society's perception of that term was negative. So then I remember Hillary Clinton years ago, she goes, ah, I'm not a liberal, I'm a progressive. So now you use a different term to describe the same thing, but it sounds much nicer. I'm progressive, I'm moving forward, I'm progressing, as opposed to being a liberal. Well, likewise, a good example is replacement theology. Folks that embrace it don't like that term because they know it sounds negative, so they go, no, I don't believe in replacement theology, I believe in fulfillment theology or inclusion theology. So the term conditional immortality is exactly that. It's an effort of annihilationists to frame it differently. And it is to a degree more nuanced, okay? So not only is it an effort at um, sort of PR, you know, more po- to put a more positive spin on annihilationism, but it's also an effort to sort of dial down a little bit more on what is actually believed. And so the term conditional immortality simply means this, and I think I'm representing those that hold this view uh, fairly. It's the idea that immortality is conditional based upon our belief in Jesus. That apart from trusting and believing in Jesus, we have no life in us. We have no immortality. Now, on the surface, that sounds like a a really coherent argument, right? Like, yeah, everyone would agree with that. Apart from Jesus, you have no life in you. So they would go on to say life and consciousness are the same thing. So in other words, if you're wicked in the afterlife and you don't have Jesus, you cease to exist. There is no consciousness. You disappear. You no longer exist. Now, of course, there's two like major problems with this. Two major problems with it. So essentially, actually, let me tease that out a little bit more. They would actually say that apart from the body, so at the beginning you had, you know, the, the Lord makes us out of clay and he breathes his spirit into us and Adam becomes a living soul a living nefesh, okay? He's a living soul, but the idea, those that embrace conditional immortality would say that apart from the body, apart from the Holy Spirit dwelling in a body of flesh, there is no consciousness. That when your body dies, you cease to exist. So most often, those that understand conditional immortality properly, they would hold that those who are dead right now, physically, are asleep. Okay, so their bodies are rotting and they're just sort of asleep. They're on pause. But at the resurrection, the Lord breathes his spirit back into them and they come back to life. So they would believe, first of all, in soul sleep. So between now and the judgment, everyone that's dead just basically doesn't exist. They're not in heaven enjoying the presence of Jesus. They're not in torment or anything. They cease to exist. Then he will resurrect them. The righteous who believed in Jesus will be given immortality, but those who didn't, they will be resurrected just for a moment. Some believe that they'll be tormented for a long time but eventually they just cease to exist. Eventually they cease to exist. Now those who embrace what I call consistent, 
conditional immortality. In other words, those who understand their view and hold to the foundational ideas, they would hold to an immediate annihilationism. So the, re the wicked are resurrected, they're immediately annihilated. Because again, you can't be conscious for millions or billions of years in torment unless you have life. Okay, so that, that's sort of what conditional immortality or annihilationism is. And again, it takes different forms. Now, the two biggest problems with conditional immortality, first of all, is that the very claim that consciousness equals life is faulty and unbiblical. They would actually go on to say the idea that we can be conscious apart from our body, just like a, as a disembodied spirit, they would say that's a pagan Greek view. They would say that's thoroughly unbiblical. They would say the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that life, that consciousness, only exists when you actually have a physical body, okay? That apart from the body, the soul cannot have consciousness. They would say that view is instead a Greek pagan worldview. That's a strong statement to make. It's a strong claim to make. Okay, so first of all, the idea that life equals consciousness or consciousness equals life is faulty and unbiblical. Okay? From a biblical perspective, life, immortality, eternal life, it is consciousness plus a particular quality of consciousness. That it's not simply a matter of being sentient and awake and aware, but it is the abundant life that comes in Jesus. It's living as we were created by our creator to experience life. That's immortality. That's eternal life. But you can be, from a biblical perspective, conscious and yet still be dead. Okay, so spiritually dead, but still conscious, still experiencing torment and suffering. The idea that that is a pagan, platonic view is thoroughly unbiblical. So let's look at some of the passages that sort of frame this out. So I want to begin, and by the way, we're just, again, super quick skimming a surface over some of the key texts. But in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 23 through 24, these are actually the last two verses in the prophecy of Isaiah. It's talking about the millennial age. And it says, During that time it shall be from the new moon to the new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. So all of mankind will bow down before the Lord, and they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. So he actually says they will see the bodies of those that were sinners. So at the very least, there's sort of this ongoing remaining from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, they will look upon the corpses of the wicked. And then he says their worm will not die. Their fire will not be quenched. So they're portrayed as being eaten by maggots and on fire but the maggots never seem to consume the flesh, and the fire never goes out. The fire is never quenched, and the worm doesn't die. There's just sort of this state of being and decay, but it goes on forever. And it says, they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. So really graphic, horrible language. Now again, for clarity, if worms, maggots eat a carcass, eventually they eat all of the flesh, and there's nothing left. You know, I've done this before with um, whatever, like animal skulls. You know, you go, I want to put that up on my garage. I would just, <laughs> this is horrible. I would just throw it in the chicken coop and let the chickens pick it clean. And then, you know, the worms and everything. And next spring or whatever, I'd get it out and, you know, sort of scrape it and pour some bleach on it or whatever. And, you know, the animals pick, there's nothing left. Likewise, when you light something on fire, eventually there's just ashes. The flames go, go out. What's being described here is not normal. It's unusual. The fire is never quenched. The worm never dies. There is, there is a perpetual nature to this, and we're going to look more at how that's understood and interpreted. Now, we're going to look at some Old Testament texts. We're also going to look at some what are called intertestamental texts. Now, to be clear, intertestamental, so deuterocanonical literature or pseudepigraphical, okay, there's different categories that put, people put these books in. They're not scripture, but they were very important books oftentimes that were read and studied by people like Jesus and the apostles during the period, they were written most often during the period in between the Old and the New Testaments. Now the view of death and the afterlife, it, the foundations for it are laid in the Old Testament, okay, but they develop pretty significantly during the intertestamental period. And then the New Testament 
picks up on and continues and reiterates the views that were solidified during the intertestamental period. Okay, so the point is only the Old Testament and New Testament is scripture. But the intertestamental literature is very important to read and study to go what were the views that were common and popular in Jesus' day. It helps us to interpret Jesus' words. When, when he makes some statements, you go, well, what does he exactly mean by that? It's easy to look at the consensus of language that was common in other religious literature of his day to understand exactly what he meant. This is very important. So just as an example to sort of tease out Isaiah's uh, statements there concerning the worm and the, and the flames, in the book of Judith, uh, chapter 16, verse 17, it says, Woe to the nations that rise up against my people. The Lord Almighty will take vengeance on them in the day of judgment. He will send fire and worms into their flesh. They shall weep in pain forever. So you can see here in the intertestamental literature, again, this is not scripture, but it helps us to understand the common views. The idea of worms and fire that last forever are communicated as people weeping in torment and agony forever. Very clear language here. I mean, there's no amb ambiguity. In the book of Sirach, the wisdom of Sirach, chapter 7, verse 17, again, relating to this, he says, humble yourself to the utmost for the punishment of the ungodly is fire and worms. Notice he says punishment, punishment. He doesn't say they will inherit fire and worms and they'll be consumed. He says they will be punished with fire and worms. And then in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, um, actually the angel Gabriel, speaking in the context of the end times, he says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. So many who are carcasses in the ground, they will awake. These to everlasting life, so the righteous to eternal everlasting life. But the others, they will awake to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, if someone ceases to exist, they no longer experience disgrace and contempt. What this is talking about is not the perception of those on the outside, but rather what they themselves will actually experience. Some will experience eternal life. Others will experience disgrace and eternal contempt. So that's an ongoing conscious um, reality. Okay, so that's for the wicked. Now, I want to just hit on several key passages, again, in the intertestamental literature, just to read them because the statements are so clear. I want to be clear again. These texts do not represent scripture. They are not God-breathed, but they are very important, and some more so than others. So in the book of 4th Ezra, sometimes called 2nd Estrus, chapter 7, verse 32 through 38, the earth shall give up those who are asleep in it. So there is the bodies that are asleep, the earth will give it up, and the dust, those who rest there in silence, and the chambers shall give up the souls that have been committed to them, the chambers like in a sepulcher, uh, more royal sepulchers that are put into these caves and chambers and so forth. The Most High shall be revealed on the seat of judgment. So here it is, the resurrection of the dead, the Almighty God, and the seat of judgment. Skipping forward, recompense shall follow and the reward shall be manifested. So either reward for the righteous, recompense for the wicked. Thoroughly biblical uh, view. Righteous deeds shall awake, unrighteous deeds shall not sleep. The pit of torment shall appear. The pit of torment. It's not the pit of destruction, the pit of annihilationism, the pit of ceasing to exist, the dark black hole. No, it's the pit of torment and opposite, opposite it, the place of rest. So you have, on one hand, you have those that are resting, that are enjoying a peaceful spring day. The other hand is the pit of torment. So you can see that at the very least, in the book of 4th Ezra, eternal conscious torment is clearly articulated. In the book of 2nd Baruch, chapter 59, verse 2, For at that time the lamp of the eternal law shone on all those who sat in darkness, which announced to them that believe the promise of their reward. And to them that deny, to the wicked that deny, the torment of fire, which is reserved for them. Again, clear language of torment, not annihilationism, but conscious torment. Second Baruch chapter 64, 7 through 10. On this account, Manasseh was at that time named the impious. And finally, his abode was in the fire. So after Manasseh died, according to Second Baruch, his living quarters are in the fire, for he had not lived perfectly, for he was not worthy 
but that thenceforward he might know by whom finally he should be tormented. The book of Enoch, chapter 10, verse 13, first Enoch, in those days they shall be led off to the abyss of fire, the pit of fire, and to the torment in the prison in which they shall be confined forever. So there's so much more. I mean, like I just read probably about a third of all of the relevant texts that I could look at within the intertestamental literature. There's just a lot of very clear language of eternal conscious torment. Now, I want to just make a quick quote from uh, the works of Josephus, of Flavius Josephus, the, um, the Jewish historian that was there in the first century during the time of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. And he says this with regard to the Pharisees. Okay, so the Pharisees, we read about them in, of course, the New Testament. It says, they also believe that souls have an immortal vigor in them. So here's Josephus talking about the Jewish view of the conservative religious Jews. He says, they believe that souls have life even apart from the body. They have an immortal vigor in them. This is not a pagan uh, Greek view. He says this is what the Pharisees believed, and that under the earth there will be rewards or punishments according as they have lived virtuously or viciously in this life, and the latter are to be detained in an everlasting prison. Now you go, who cares what the Pharisees believed? Matthew 23, verse 2 through 3, Jesus says this, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but don't do as they do because they're a bunch of hypocrites. He goes, but in terms of what they believe, in terms of what the Pharisees believe, Jesus basically affirms a lot of what they believe. There's times that he challenges things and he tweaks things. But there's no reason to believe that Jesus, as a conservative first century Jew, would have held anything different than what Josephus just articulates. Or what is clearly articulated in a lot of the Jewish intertestamental literature. Now let's look at the... Uh, testimony of the New Testament. And again, we're just barely touching on a lot of the relevant texts. Jesus obviously clearly believed in the consciousness of the soul in the intermediary period. What do I mean by that? If someone is to die now, between now and the judgment when he returns and he judges mankind, the interim period, Jesus clearly believed that souls were conscious. In Luke 23, verse 43, he said to who? The thief on the cross, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He's not saying in a couple thousand years you'll wake up at the resurrection. He says this very day, your spirit, because you just got saved, you're going to be with me in paradise, experiencing the rewards, the, the rest of paradise. Okay, so even in the interim period, you have a reflection of the eternal state, rewards or punishment. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, The sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. The sons of the kingdom of darkness will be cast into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can't weep if you don't exist. You can't have bitter regret gnashing your teeth if you don't exist. It's impossible. Matthew 25, 41 through 46. At the time of the judgment of the sheep and goats judgment, he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed ones into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will inherit eternal life. Again, very clear. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, he says, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. Notice the fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night tormented. Okay, here's the devil and the beast, the Antichrist and the false prophet, are tormented in fire and brimstone forever and ever, day and night, forever and ever. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 12 says, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or out of the body, I don't know. He goes, he was taken up to heaven. But notice this, Paul the Apostle doesn't say, well, obviously he couldn't have been out of his body because that's a pagan view. That's a Greek view. That's not biblical. No, from Paul, who was a thoroughly Old Testament, biblically literate Jew, he goes, I don't know if I was in my body or out. The point being, it's entirely possible to be outside of your body and to be very conscious. 
The idea that consciousness apart from the body is impossible biblically is a horrible, bad argument. And again, he says, whether in the body or out of it, I don't really know. Luke chapter 16, 19 through 25. This is the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Some people believe it's a parable. Some people believe it's a true story. Um, I'm open to it being a parable. Um, I lean toward it being a real story. Um, but I'm open either way. But regardless as to what you believe, it clearly teaches consciousness of either rest and rewards or punishment and torment during the interim period between now and the ultimate judgment as a prelude, as a reflection of what the eternal state will be. Jesus says, now there was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at, Lazarus was laid at, at his gate, covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angels, where what Jesus calls Abraham's bosom. He was, he was close to and being comforted with Abraham. And the rich man also died and was buried. And where is he? He's in hell. He's in Hades. And he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And uh, he says, he goes on to say, I am in agony in this flame. Please, like, give me some water just to put a few drops on my tongue, but I'm in agony. And then the Lord says, no, this wicked one, he is, um, the righteous one is being comforted here, but you're in agony. So now here's the question. For conditional annihilationists, who say that the idea of consciousness apart from the body is a Greek pagan view, do we really believe that Jesus would tell a parable using a thoroughly pagan view of the afterlife, even just to tell a story? And the answer is, of course not. Like, that's, I'm sorry, absolutely ridiculous. It's untenable. I can't buy it. It's nonsense. It's baloney, okay? The bottom line, like, imagine this, like, just uh, as an example. Imagine Jesus saying, once upon a time there was a man who died, and he was reincarnated as a snail. Like, to tell a lesson. He's not going to tell a parable using a thoroughly unbiblical pagan worldview to, to, to teach a lesson. He's articulating his view, the Jewish view, which is that during the interim period, the wicked are in torment, the experience torment. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 10. Peter says, if God did not spare angels, so he's talking about the wicked fallen angels when they sinned. He says, rather, he cast them into hell and he committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So he says, presently, the wicked angels that fell, at least many of them, are being kept in prisons of darkness. They are being reserved for the day of judgment. And then he goes on. He says, if God did that with the angels, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from the unrighteous and temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment also for the day of judgment. So he says, both the fallen angels and the unrighteous who have died are presently being kept under punishment reserved for the ultimate day of judgment. They are not asleep. They are not ceasing to exist. They are awake in prison being punished. That is the Jewish view. That it, exactly as we see articulated throughout the intertestamental literature, in the words of Jesus, that Peter in the book of Revelation clearly affirm. Now back to the verses that we looked at. Revelation 14. If anyone worships the beast and his image, and he receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, and this is one of the clearest statements in the New Testament concerning eternal conscious torment, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. When is the full wrath, the full, the full cup of the wrath of God poured out? It's after death. It's not during the great tribulation. Yes, there will be tremendous wrath of God that will be poured out on the earth. I believe ultimately after Jesus returns. But the ultimate wrath to come is actually after death. It says, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of the Lord's anger. And these wicked ones will be tormented with fire and brimstone. There it is, fire and brimstone, the same thing that awaited Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the beast and the false prophet. Those who worship him will meet the same fate as Satan himself. 
they will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the face of, right in front of, the prosopone of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Okay, so let me just say this. The case for traditionalism is far more rock solid than the case for annihilationism or conditional immortality. Absolutely. If you really work through the Old Testament, the intertestamental literature, if we're really honest, the comments by Josephus, even the Talmud, there were some other different ideas occasionally that popped up. Sometimes the the Jews, the rabbis would argue, well, are they tormented for a year? Are they tormented for longer? And they eventually cease to exist, but the majority held to the idea of eternal conscious torment. There were some other ideas, you know, that do pop up here and there. And we also have to acknowledge that some of the language, some of the comments that Jesus makes do seem to indicate destruction, okay? But it's not a matter of picking. Well, I'm going to pick the verses that sound like he's talking about destruction and ignore the verses where he clearly, in the New Testament, clearly affirms conscious torment. It's both. The destruction of the wicked and eternal conscious torment are one and the same. They are destroyed, yet they remain conscious. Now, all of that said, I want to be real transparent with you. I want to be real honest with you. Deep down in my heart, emotionally, do I believe in eternal conscious torment? So let's just take, for example, you know, the sort of classic little uh, anecdote that people always use. But what about the native? What about the native there in the jungles that never heard about Jesus? You're trying to tell me that God created them so as to be tormented in hell forever because they didn't ever hear about Jesus? Is that fair? This is the type of accusation that you'll hear from unbelievers. Okay, that's a very challenging, difficult question. I want to be honest. What about like, you know, Uncle Mike, you know, whoever, like somebody that you love, nice person, you know, maybe a little bit of a weasel sometimes, but for the most part, a really good guy, but he just never really came to faith. And then he dies. And you go, I loved Mike. Like, he always was a nice guy to me. Do I believe that he would be tormented, wriggling in agony unto the ages of ages forever and ever and ever without ceasing, never ending for eternity? No end, just ongoing fire and agony forever. Do I really emotionally believe that deep down inside? And I would say this. I don't know. If I'm to be honest, I can't wrap my head around that. Do I believe that the scriptures clearly use that language of eternal conscious torment? Absolutely, I believe that. But here's the thing, and I touched on this earlier. Emotionally, I don't want to believe. I don't like it. I hate the idea of hell. Yet it's clearly a foundational part of my faith. Everything that I confess publicly and say I believe, eternal conscious torment is absolutely part of that. But do I like it? Of course I don't. I don't think anyone should like it. But on this side of eternity... On this side of not seeing the fullness of the way the Lord sees things from a heavenly perspective, I hate it. I hate the idea of eternal conscious torment. I would far rather believe that the native just ceased to exist, that he just gets erased. But the idea of him writhing in agony forever or Uncle Mike writhing in agony, like that's hard to stomach. That's hard. I want to be honest with that. And also, let me say that the really smart guys that articulate conditional immortality, they make uh, pretty effective arguments. They're very persuasive. But the bottom line is, I would argue that their arguments are good not because they're really rock-solid arguments, because they're not. They're good because it appeals to a corrupt emotionalism within all of us. The bottom line is we do tend to believe things, and, and this is I'm tying this now to the issue of the, the perseverance of the saints, of what will it take to endure to the end. We have to trust the Lord. We have to trust the Lord. And even if you go, I kind of don't think I believe that, here's the thing. What if you're wrong? What if your emotions are misleading you? And the bottom line is, guys, the reality is our emotions mislead us constantly. As I said... There's plenty of lies out there in the world to be believed. But what we have to do is come honestly before the scriptures and say, what do the scriptures say? And do I choose to submit myself to the word of God or do I choose to submit myself to my own corrupt fallen emotions? 
And I would say we need to submit to the Word of God. And so how will I teach? I will always teach what I believe the Bible teaches, which is eternal conscious torment. That's what it says. Now, is it possible? Let me just say this. Is it possible that the Scriptures use hyperbole? And that maybe after a million years, the, the sin of the wicked is purged, and eventually they cease to exist, and they just burn out like a match. And the torment ends, and they end, and they cease to exist, and they are erased. Is that possible? Sure, I think it's possible. Yes, the scriptures use hyperbole a lot. I could give, like, dozens upon dozens of examples. You know, I think of, like, when Israel comes into the Holy Land, and they send in the spies, and they come back, and they go, we, have, we can't beat them. They have walls all the way up to heaven. You know, I go, well, how high is heaven? 100 feet? You know, like, do they have walls, fortresses that were 100 feet tall? And the 500? How high is heaven? 1,000 feet? The point is simply, they had some really high walls. And am I open to the idea that eventually, the, am I open to the idea of conditional immortality in the sense that emotionally, can I comfort my heart with my, my lack of comfort over the idea of eternal conscious torment? Can I comfort my heart by saying maybe eventually, after a billion years, they cease to exist? I go, that's quite possible. But I don't know. I simply have to take the word of God for what it says, and I need to use that reality and do my best to burn that reality so that my emotions come into alignment with what God says, with what his word says, and then live a life that reflects me actually believing that re reality, submitting my emotions to the word of God. Now, okay, for others, and I just want to say this, I want to be honest. There are some that will come and they'll say, I can't believe the gospel because I can't believe that God would create people only to be tormented forever. And I would say this, if this is a huge stumbling block to you coming to faith, just put it on the shelf and trust that God is faithful don't let your intellectual you know, discomfort or your emotional discomfort with the teaching of hell stop you from becoming a Christian. Is it possible that the Lord eventually annihilates the wicked? Possibly. I don't know. Here is what I do know. Here is what I do know. And I want to just read from Revelation 15, verses 3 through 4. So here we are just a few verses later. And these are those that are standing in the presence of the Lamb, the redeemed. And it says, they sang the song of Moses the bond servant of God and the song of the lamb. So they're now, all their eyes are open. They're on the other side. They're not on this side in darkness, seeing through a glass darkly. They see the reality, the punishment of the wicked, the rewards of the righteous. Nothing is hidden at this point. Their eyes are wide open. Do they get before the Lord and say, Lord, you're awfully harsh, overbearing. Don't you think this is a little excessive? You're a pretty severe, mean guy. They're not singing that at all. Quite to the contrary. They're singing, Great and marvelous are your works, O God, the Almighty, righteous and true. Righteous and true are your ways. Just and fair and righteous and true and holy, with eyes wide open, not under compulsion. Here's the point. When all is said and done, we're going to stand before him and say, Wow, you are fair. You are so fair and righteous and just. King of the nations, who will not fear you? Who will not glorify your name? You alone are perfect and holy and praiseworthy. All the nations from now on will come and worship rightly before you. For your righteous deeds, your righteous acts have been revealed. I want to tell a, a very personal story. Um, and it's kind of hard to explain. But it's something that it branded me personally, and I've tried to live by it ever since. This happened um, about 22 years or so ago, maybe more, maybe like 26 years ago. Yeah, actually, it's more like 27, right, anyway, a long time ago. So I had moved out to Kansas City, um, so I was still a relatively new believer. Now, after high school, I, um, my first job out of high school was I was a garbage man. Um, fun little Joel Richardson trivia fact. My first job was a garbage man out of high school. I worked on the back of the garbage truck in the town called Hull, Massachusetts, um, which is a beach town. It's kind of a peninsula and then a little island with a bridge that connects. It was a pretty neat place to work, except in the winter because it was brutal. Um, but we're on the back of the truck all day, you know, slinging. Uh, every day I'd be slinging. We were slinging trash in the back of the garbage truck. 
and my good friend that I had known for years that worked on the back of the truck with me, uh, his name was Ed. And I got saved, you know, I came to faith, I moved out to Kansas City, and one day I got a call from a friend of mine, and he said, hey, you know, I've got really bad news about Ed, uh, he's, uh, he's in the hospital, he's brain dead. And uh, what happened was he was picking up his girlfriend from work, and there were these kids, uh, now Ed at the time, I believe he was 20, I believe he was 20 years old, may, may have been 21, and there was a bunch of kids, they were like 16 years old, that were out for the past few days, they had been engaging in something that's called wilding. It's a legal term that means they were just going out randomly and just beating up strangers for fun, for entertainment. Ed was just parked in front of the sub shop, picking up his girlfriend after work. These kids pulled up. Someone threw a beer bottle at his van. You know, they start yelling at him. He's just sitting there. Now, let me just say this about Ed. He was a big, tall guy, real skinny, um, but he was a wimp. I used to always wrestle him and beat him up and stuff. He just was not really super coordinated, but he had long hair and a beard, and he looked a lot like Jesus, maybe from the film Jesus of Nazareth, you know, Franco Zeffirelli's uh, film. But he, he, he looked probably intimidating maybe to, you know, 16-year-old kids, uh, but he was a wimp. Anyway, they kind of surrounded his van and doing the typical back then, you know, 25 some odd years ago, early 90s, Boston sort of thing. He gets out of the van with a baseball bat to protect himself. They surround him, slam him in the door. He drops the bat. One of the guys picks up the bat, begins to uh, club him in the head. Um, someone else picked up a broken beer bottle and stabbed him in the face and ruptured his eye, one of his eyeballs. And uh, this kid hit him, crushed, completely crushed his skull. One of the kids actually said they felt their hand going through his skull as they were hitting him. And uh, he basically died there um, in the parking lot. I mean, he, his brain was still alive. So I get this call. Again, we've been friends for years. I go out to the funeral. And I, I want to be careful here not to exaggerate this, but, you know, um, I got some great buddies that I grew up with, but, you know, these are my, I always just call them my drug friends, but, I mean, they're just great guys, you know, just the guys that I used to just um, party with and everything before I before I became a Christian. Um, but I, I love them all dearly, but I was at one of their houses, and one of the guys, um, another guy named Ed, he was sitting there, and he said, we need to grab a few shotguns and drive by where these other kids live. It was a couple towns over, a town called Rockland. And he said, we just need to do drive-by and just take a few of them out. And um, whether he was serious or not, you know, I don't know, but he kind of threw that out. And, uh, and we, he had, we had a lot of weapons. And again, I'm a, I'm a new Christian. And so I'm here with most of my friends that are not Christians, and I, I start preaching. I start going, no, guys, like, we, we don't need to go do a drive-by, like, bad idea. Um, we need to forgive them. The Lord calls us to forgive them. And so I'm trying to be a good Christian. And they just looked at me with such disgust. Like, how could you say that? How could you forgive them? They just murdered Ed in cold blood for no reason. He was innocent. He was just picking up his girlfriend. And they beat him to death. They beat him to death. And they were just like appalled that I would even suggest the idea of forgiveness. And the truth is, I kind of almost felt a little guilty when I said it. I was like, ah, man. you know, like f feeling horrible. I go to the funeral, and one of the guys, I was standing up next to the casket. It was an open casket, and um, we we're standing there. And I put my hand on his shoulder, and he just, just get your hand out. You know, like, don't even touch me. Don't even talk to me. Like, he was mad at me because I had suggested that we forgive the kids that had just done this to our mutual friend. And uh, so, okay, so there's my experience. I come back to Kansas City. I know this is kind of a long story. But again, I'm a new believer. I have embraced belief in hell. And let me just say this. When I got saved, it was the message of hell. The Lord spoke to me in a powerful way. And he said, the trajectory that your life is on, you don't have the moral breaks. If you don't fully give me your life tonight, your destiny is in hell. Like, that's what he spoke to me. Your destiny is in the flames of hell. And I just said, absolutely, you're right. Like, I didn't like the idea of hell. But as I became aware of what the Bible teaches about these things, the conviction of the Holy Spirit was there in a powerful way. And I'll never forget the preacher I was in this meeting was reading from the words of the Gospel of Matthew, 
John the Baptist, where he says, the ax at the root of the tree has already been laid. Of course, he's speaking of Israel, but I took it on a personal level. The ax has already been laid at the root of the tree, therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance, because the whole tree is about to fall down, is what he was saying. But he says, for every branch that does not bear fruit will be cast into the fire. And I just, the Lord spoke to me, I, again, in a powerful way, and he just said, if you don't fully give your life to me tonight, you will, your destiny is in hell. And I just said, you're absolutely right. And I gave my life to him. Now, here we are a couple years later. My buddy gets killed. I come back to Kansas City, and I'm sitting in a meeting. Now, this is going to sound real unusual. And I don't often share stories like this. I'm kind of a big fan, to be honest with you, of um, keeping most of our, like, as Pentecostals charismatics, we tend to just, as soon as something happens, we hear a little voice, we just, we get a little ember, we blow on it, we, we trumpet it, we make a big deal. I had a vision, I had an experience, I had a dream. I, years ago, I, I read a uh, biography, well, it was just, sorry, I guess, a biography of Francis of Assisi, many years ago. It was really good. I mean, uh, if you don't like Catholics, okay, whatever. He was a pretty amazing guy, and he had a lot of, like, really divine encounters with the Lord. And according to his friends, they said like 95% of all the experiences that Francis had, he never, ever shared. He kept them to himself. He shared some things, but the majority he kept to himself. You know, I think of that, that old song. Um, I know I shouldn't even try it, but, you know, I keep my visions to myself. I'm of the opinion that we charismatics overshare. I'm going to share this because I think it's really relevant right now, and it is personal, but... Um, that's just sort of a side exhortation. I'm of the opinion that probably 90% of the things that we share publicly in the, pro in the charismatic Pentecostal world probably should be held on to a bit more closely. That's just my philosophy. Okay, so I come back from the funeral, and I'm in this meeting, and there's a, a minister that is really gifted in prophecy and words of knowledge. Okay, he moves in that in a pretty accurate way. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at this picture that was on the wall in this room. And the Lord arranged all this. I have no question the Lord arranged it. And it's a painting that someone had done from the film, Jesus, Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Franco Zeffirelli. And it's Mary. She's all in black. And she's holding the body of her son, who she just took down off the cross. She's holding the body of Jesus in the rain. And she's just in agony, crying out to the Lord to heaven. And as I'm staring at this painting, so again, just to fill out the backstory, when Ed died, finally, when they pulled the plug, his mother held his body. He was already dead, it was clear. She held his body as they pulled the plug and as the life itself actually left his body, as his heart stopped, stopped beating. And she said, I held my baby when he came into this world and I'm gonna hold him when he goes out. And so I'm staring at this picture of Jesus as Mary is holding Jesus. And for the first time in my life, I'm, I'm like, we talk a lot about the agony of the father who allowed his son to be crucified for us. But that poor woman, that poor woman was still Jesus's mother. And she went through the same thing of holding her innocent son, his body. And again, as I said, Ed looked a lot like Jesus, like the picture was just and I'm staring at it, and these thoughts start going through my head, and I'm just gonna say it this way. What began as natural thoughts slipped into a, a, a vision. It was not a massive technicolor vision, but it was pretty close. I haven't had tremendous number of visions in my life, but I've had a few, and this was one time, and it was the weirdest thing, because the way I'll tell it is strange. In the vision, I'm seeing these kids beat Ed to death with the baseball bat as he goes down. It was like I was there. And I said to the Lord, as it was, it, it, every, with every blow, it was like I was there. It was sending shock waves through my body. I was trembling. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, I know that you say that all sins equal and all sin deserves death and all sin deserves hell. And I've done a lot of things in my life, but I've never done that. I've never just killed an innocent person. 
And so here's what here's I'm gonna kind of tell the story because it's it's strange. I clo- I'm looking at the picture of Jesus. I close my eyes. I go into this vision. I'm just sitting there. This guy walks over, the minister. He's walking around, and he's kind of ministering to people, and he walks over, and he puts his hand on my head. And he starts singing. He prophesies, but he kind of sings. And he says, you will be like my son, David. You will be like my son, David. And what goes through my head as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm seeing this vision, but I'm not thinking, wow, I'm seeing a vision. I'm just caught up in the emotion of it. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I've never killed anyone. I don't care what your word says. Those kids deserve hell. I don't deserve hell, but they do. And then this guy says, you'll be like my son, David. And this is what goes through my head. Give me a break. Give me a break. This guy up here, I hear him, but I'm kind of not paying attention. I said, this guy thinks he's prophesying like, Oh, all this charismatic prophecy stuff. It's always so positive. Oh, you're going to be great. You're going to be like David. I'm like, give me a break. He doesn't even know what I'm thinking right now. I am leaving the faith behind right now. Like, I'm so angry. My friends are right. My unbelieving friends are right. You don't forgive that. This was the anger that I had in me. I'm not even thinking like, I'm, being, I'm having a vision, and I'm thinking incredibly carnal thoughts. And I go, this guy, I think he's prophesying. Give me a break. Oh, you're going to be like David. Give me a break. That, this is what's happening. As soon as he says, you'll be like my son David, and I'm going, those kids deserve hell. I don't. The vision changes. And instead of Ed, it's Jesus. And again, Ed looked just similar to you know pictures that you see of Jesus. And I'm holding the baseball bat. And the Lord said, you killed my son. You deserve hell. And I heard it as clear as day. And it was just like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Now get this. This is the powerful part. The Lord said, you killed my son. Your sin. He wouldn't have had to have died if it wasn't for your sin. And then this guy finishes his statement. He says, you'll be like my son, David, quick to repent. And the whole thing just comes unraveled. Like, so what happened, and and to understand the sort of weird poetic nature of what just happened to me, is the Lord allowed me to express my emotions. I don't deserve hell. I deserve to be punished, but I don't deserve what they deserve. And the Lord says, no, you killed my innocent son. You do deserve hell. And then just to put an exclamation point on it, this guy up here that I'm just going, "Ah, he's not not hearing from God. He says, you'll be like David, quick to repent. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks, and I just broke. I actually, I was still kind of a new believer. You know, I stood up, and I think I kicked the chair over and stormed out of the room, and I just went outside. And I just wept because it was for the first time in my life the Lord spoke to me and communicated to me the reality and the gravity of my sin. And it was like he reminded me, like, oh, you, you, you've never done anything that bad. And he, like, reminded me, because I have done some really horrible things. The reality of hell has gripped me ever since. Now, again, guys, all I know is that I trust the Lord. All I know is that I trust the Lord. And you'll hear people in the church argue. You know, they'll argue and they'll say, well, we shouldn't be negatively motivated by hell. We should only be positively motivated by our rewards. And I say, no, actually, scripturally speaking, it's both. Because the bottom line is, I wouldn't have gotten saved if I believed in annihilationism. I wouldn't have. Now, I want to be clear. Everyone's different. Everybody is raised different. They have different emotional makeup and that sort of thing. I'm someone, for what it's worth, I don't. I'm kind of like an unbroken horse. Like even 30 some odd years later, yes, I have worked to embrace the cross and to die, but I'm kind of a wild, loose cannon to a degree. I need the restrictions of hell, quite frankly. If I fully believe that hell doesn't exist, I remember a friend of mine once said, he said, why can't can't he just destroy us and eliminate us? I'm fine with that. He said, just let me live my life. Then when I die, let me disappear. He goes, I'm good with that. You know, like there's really not a tremendous threat of annihilationism. Yeah, 
yeah, it's uncomfortable, but it's like going to the dentist. You go to sleep, it's all over. You don't experience it. You don't know it. I kind of get that. Like part of me resonates with that. If I truly believed in annihilationism, uh, you know, part of me says, why risk dying to everything? When at the very least, you can sort of experience all of the, you know, pleasures of this world. But I go, no, I, I do believe in hell just because of what the scriptures say, because my own personal experiences, and for those that wrestle with it, I'm just going to say, what if? From just a simple gambling, pragmatic perspective, and here's what I've come to is, and I'll be honest with you, even if hell isn't real, I don't care. I'm going to live my life like it is. I choose to believe the word of God. I choose to believe what the scriptures say, because the bottom line is in terms of, you know, risk, sort of gaming out the, the uh, risk-reward scenario, we're risking far more. We're risking eternity, eternal conscious torment. I'm happy to die to this life believing in faith that the things that he says are true. I'm happy to forsake my life and embrace the cross. But it's going to be a struggle, isn't it? It's going to be a struggle. And this is something. This is something we're going to wrestle with. I think for the rest of our lives, and the harder it gets, the harder that our cross has become to bear, the more that we have to be resolved to say, Lord, I trust your word. Your word says it, I believe it. And so I'm going to live a life of holiness and a life of urgency for the proclamation of the gospel, for the completion of the Great Commission, for all of these things. The scriptures say that in the days ahead, there's going to be a great falling away from the faith. I think we're already in that time, quite frankly so many that I've seen, and I've seen it happen. Oftentimes, those who start rejecting the idea of hell, a few years later, they just walk away from the faith. Oftentimes, it's sort of the canary in the coal mine. Not always. There are those that believe in conditional annihilationism, and they're still strong Christians. I want to be clear. There are some people that the idea of eternal conscious torment is just such an offense that they can't come to faith believing that. And I just say to them, put it on the shelf. Just trust the Lord. Let him, you know, we'll understand it better by and by. Don't let that be a stumbling block. Again, emotionally, everyone's different. But I would say for myself and for most people, I needed to believe it in order to make the radical transformation that I did. And to a degree, I need it to continue on. I need to continue to believe what the Word says in order to endure until the very end. And I think personally that we all do. Now, again, you know, you've got all these statements, Jesus and the Olivet Discourse, watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out that no one deceives you. Deception will be an earmark of the last days. But likewise, and I talked about this in John 7, verse 16 through 17, Jesus answered them and he said, Listen, guys, my teaching is not mine. It comes from the Father. It comes from your Creator. It comes from the one who sent me. He says, but if anyone... Now, here's the key. If anyone is willing to do his will, then he will know the teaching, whether it's from God or not. Jesus himself specifically says, you will believe the truth not based on whether you intellectually can embrace it. He says, based on whether you're willing to do the will of the Father. There is something deep inside our spirits. When we say yes to him, we're willing to believe the things that he says, even when they're uncomfortable. But when we're not willing to do his will, and this is, this is my point, when our lives don't line up with what we believe, we will find ways to accommodate our beliefs to our actions. So we need to repent. We need to be aware of the lies that we tell ourselves to accommodate and to justify our hypocritical actions. That's why every little act, every little decision that we make is relevant. The little, little lies that we tell years down the road lead to the falling away of the faith. I've seen it. We need to take these things in a very serious way. He goes, if anyone is willing to do the will of the Father, he'll know the truth. We will know the truth. So as a final exhortation, I just want to say, moving forward in the days ahead, as many people are abandoning basic biblical truths regarding issues like homosexuality or this or that, whatever the world says, the pressure is too hard, they reject it. Regarding hell, they reject it. 
these things lead to the shipwreck and the walking away from the faith and actually denying Jesus, the one that died for us, the one that purchased us. I desperately don't want to see another one walk away. I don't want to be susceptible. I don't want to be part of that myself. Look, the bottom line is we're all susceptible. If any one of you says, I could never fall away, that's impossible, then it says, be careful lest you stand, you think you stand lest you fall, right? It's humility that will guard us. Humility will guard us. We need to submit our beliefs to the Word of God. Ultimately, and this has just been my life the past, you know, season is, um, it's been really blessed in, in a way. It's been painful. But my wife often goes to bed early with her uh, physical stuff. By the end of the day, she's usually in horrible pain. And so she tends to go to bed pretty early, and I end up with a few hours. And I'm not a big fan of just watching TV. So um, I often sit out in my back patio and just pray. And sometimes I get a few hours. And uh, I think it's good. I don't think we should pour out our laments to each other too much because that can become whining. But I think the Lord is fine when we pour out our laments and our grievances to him. But then after that's all said and done, every day I resolve. I, I close my eyes. I picture myself on the cross, and I just say, yes. All of my hopes, all of my dreams, all of the things that I desire, in this, die to it. Die to it. Forget it. I'm fine with that. I say yes to you, Jesus. And I resolve to embrace the cross. And sometimes we need to do that every day, sometimes multiple times through the day, depending on our present crosses that we're carrying. We all carry different crosses. He gives us all different loads to carry. But it's important that we resolve to embrace the cross and say yes to it every day. And the motivating factor is twofold. On one side, it's the reality of hell. On the other side, and I do agree, this should be our primary motivating factor. Dalton talked a lot about this which is the rewards that we'll inherit. It's not just about what we're avoiding. We need to talk a lot more about the positive aspects of that which we'll receive. So I'm going to end by reading Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 3, because this is our ultimate positive motivation. I don't want to just talk about hell and end it there. I want to end on a positive note. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us you and me. Sin, compromise, lies, deception, they can so easily entangle every one of us. Let us lay aside everything that is a hindrance. Yeah, I, my exercise of choice, I love just getting out and running. I say running, it's more like jogging may not even be fair. I'm slow as a snail, but I go out and I trot. I don't, let's just call it trotting. I like getting out and, and jogging. Uh, middle age, like I said, I just turned 50. I can go up and down and wait. And I've calculated before. I mean, I can go up and down like 30 pounds, 40 pounds without even trying. Um, A gallon of milk weighs 8 pounds. A gallon of milk weighs 8 pounds. So let's just say I go up 24 pounds. Let's say I go up 32 pounds. I've done that. That's 4 gallons of milk. Now, take 4 gallons of milk and strap it to your waist and see how fast you're going to run, right? Right? But this is like what we're doing. Those of us that we kind of go, well, you know, I believe biblical faith, but I also want to continue to enjoy a little bit of the pleasures of this world just in case. No, he says, throw away every hindrance and the sin that can so easily entangle us. Because the bottom line is you're flirting with death flirting with eternal torment. I mean, like, how much easier can you run when you get rid of those extra four gallons of milk? Or sometimes more. 40 pounds, four, five gallons of milk. Right? It feels so much better when you're running and you get rid of all these encumbrances. Well, life is better when you free ourselves from the sin and the compromise and the lies that so easily entangle us. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Guys, let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, fixing our eyes on what? Jesus. Yes, hell is a negative motivator, but ultimately our eyes are fixed forward on the prize that he's provided for us. Fix our eyes on Jesus because he is the prize, by the way. He is the example, he's the foundation, he's the model, and he is the goal. All of the above. It says he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And how did he live? For the joy set before him. In this life, we will have pain. We will sigh, we'll groan. 
but we have joy unspeakable that will never be taken away, laid in store in front of us. Jesus himself, for the joy set before him, endured his cross, despising the shame. Of course he did. But when all was said and done, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Consider him. Think about him. Meditate upon him. That's our example, right? So I'm just going to leave you with that. Jesus is our example. He fixed his eyes on the joy set before him, and he is our joy, and we're called to imitate Jesus. So I trust that this um, exhortation was helpful and important. Again, please um, take some time to get before the Lord and really weigh these things in your heart carefully. We have a race. We have quite a bit of a race still ahead of us. We're called to endure it, to run with abandon, and we can do it. It's possible. Many have gone before us, and they've succeeded, and I'm confident that he who purchased us, you know, I'm just, I'm flashing back to when Jesus prays the the high priestly prayer. He goes, Father, I didn't lose any that you gave me except for the one, the son of perdition. I'm confident that everyone watching this will fall in that category. He can keep us. His, his strength, his resources are available. So let's embrace him. Let's cling to him. Amen.